Asking questions about the daily procedures in the lab, I was intrigued to learn that paper was still an important tool in these days of electronic notebooks. The 3D work shown here is made by drying paper, newly formed sheets inside a mannequin discarded from a menswear shop. When this paper torso was released from the mannequin form, an area of paper roughly around where the heart might be stuck inside and detached itself from the rest of the sculpture. This is a composite form, more paper mache than sheet formed and it awaits a cellulose heart. In this assemblage, showing mice presents the idea of the similarities of their cells and human cells. And these paper mice are made in a mould and their bright paper tails reference the dyes used in stem cell research. They're also uniform in shape and size to refer to the amazing regenerative ability of the liver. The mice are surrounded, bound together by lace, a symbol of the connectiveness of cells, particularly stem cells, and mesh, again about connectiveness and containment. Paper is made from cellulose fibres binding together, and stem cell research is looking at ways to make cells work together to repair human and animal bodies. Here we have a bit of old and new. We could be glancing out the window or reading a poem or an alchemist's recipe. Before bound books, paper scrolls were used to record and display information and artwork. Scrolls were not on display permanently. Paper has also been used for windows in Korea, Japan and parts of China. Plus, there was a tradition of paper windows being used in print works in this country also. And the annual window papering days were seen as a relief by the printing apprentices from their normal tasks. These scrolls were made of handmade paper and seemed to display emblems and messages from an earlier time or from the future. They are hung apart and together on twigs and plant stems. The scrolls seem rigid and fixed, but also their size makes them seem ephemeral, as though they could be blown away by the same wind that could blow away the twigs. When we look at pictures or photographs of stem cells under the microscope, we see they can be stained with different coloured dyes to make it simpler to point out the stem cells and the functions of the cells. And Sunil said to me that the artwork produced depicting stem cells should be 3D to show the nature of the work. This recycled paper work shown here is framed with a paper maker's decal and the differences of the raised surface arise from pressing wet paper onto textured cloth. The colours uh, from the dye that was used in the paper's previous life or lives. Catalogue on a blue sky. Outside my father's office at the Dominion Farmers Institute in Wellington, New Zealand was a framed grid of wool samples prepared for an exhibition showcasing products from the British Empire. And as a small child, I'd read the names underneath the samples. Leicester... Suffolk, Merino, and so forth, and tried to make connections and tried to fix in my mind the different properties and the different sheep and where they came from, but they never really stuck. As an adult, at the end of the day, when I've been working on the allotment, I would see, on closing my eyes at night, images of the different plants, the leaf formations, regular or irregular, were spread out before my eyes under my eyelids, or in my mind's eye, all the work had painstakingly been catalogued in my mind. The weeds from the crops, the pointed leaves, the rounded leaves, irregular shapes, the Fibonacci filigrees. So when I visited labs and talked to scientists who spent a lot of time looking down microscopes, I wondered and I asked them if the images stayed in their minds as well at night.
even though all the other things you have to do <laughs> during the day. And a lot of them said yes, whether they were humouring me, I don't know. But this artwork is based on those wool samples and the ideas of blue sky, thinking ahead, making sense of the world, pulling it all together, and there it is. I am a PhD student in the Centre for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine at King's College London. I study skin biology, specifically how different populations of cells in our skin interact during normal skin development and wound healing. Skin is the largest organ in our body and its function is paramount to our survival. It can be divided into several regions depending on depth, epidermis, dermis and fat. The epidermis is the outmost layer of our skin which is visible to the naked eye. Beneath the epidermis lies the dermis. Within the dermis, the main cell type are called fibroblasts, which are well known for their ability to produce collagen and to provide the structural framework of the skin. The dermis also harbors specialized structures such as hair follicles, the erected pillar muscle, which is responsible for making your hair stand on end, and sweat glands. Reciprocal communication between cells in the epidermis and dermis are integral to skin development and repair. My aim of the project with Georgina was to find out a little bit about the life of a scientist, spending some time with her in the lab and sketching and then talking to her about her work and trying to bring to life the inner world of the cells, showing microscopic worlds in the outside world and to make visible what can't be seen by the naked eye in some of my paintings. So I wasn't going to copy the slides of cells but just use them for inspiration and then try to enhance the rhythm and movements of the variety of the different parts of the cells moving about and growing and reacting and changing so to give the cells some movement through the way I use line and colour and the art medium of dropping watercolour inks into water then controlling the flow of pigment to show different reactions and create life of the cells as the wound heals. Hoping that this will promote stem cell research in wound healing to the wider public through the series of artwork and the exhibition and I want to show what's hidden, usually just seen through a microscope in the paintings. We hope that the project will improve the well-being of people that look at the artwork and as well, obviously, through the research, but through the intense colours in the paintings, I hope that that will be therapeutic and enhance the mood of people that see the images. Skin samples that we receive in the lab are embedded in a freezing medium, which preserves the cellular structures without damage and are stored at minus 80 degrees. When we want to visualise different cell populations within our samples, the first stage is to cut the skin into thin sections, we do this using a machine called a cryostat. After cutting the sample, the freshly cut sections are either collected on microscope slides or placed into small dishes depending on their thickness. In the above picture and beautiful drawings, I have just finished cutting several skin sections and I'm about to inspect the quality of the cut using a microscope to ensure that all specialised skin structures are intact. The above painting is a beautiful representation of tissue processing which occurs during histology. Whilst Joy was shadowing me, I was processing wounded and unwounded skin samples, investigating the relationship between fibroblasts and pericytes and how they are involved in the wound healing process. This is represented in the small depictions above my head, where you can see wounds and blood vessels. The above drawings show the cryostat cutting process in more detail. Samples are carefully cut by turning the wheel one-handed whilst the other hand gently guides the sample using a paintbrush over the cutting block. The bottom right drawing shows me reapplying the frozen matrix to the sample, re-preserving it and allowing more sections to be cut later. Both of these images are of a wound 10 days after injury. The top image was taken using a microscope with fluorescent antibodies labelling different structures of interest. The epidermis is in white slash orange, hair follicles are in pink, and fibroblasts and blood vessels are in red. The wound bed resides within the white dotted line and normal skin structure can be seen on either side. 
The bottom image is a magnificent representation of the above wound, the varying colours capturing the dynamic nature of the wound healing process. Wound healing and tissue regeneration is a coordinated process that involves epidermal, dermal and immune cells working together. In this sample, we have zoomed in to focus on the wound bed itself and not the surrounding healthy tissue. The sample also has different cells represented with different colours. In red are blood vessels and their associated cells. In green are muscle cells and activated fibroblasts. These are two images of blood vessels from the lower layer of the dermis, deep beneath the surface of our skin. The top image was taken with a microscope and has fluorescent antibodies labelling specific cells associated with the vessel. In green are vascular smooth muscle cells, which form most of the blood vessel wall, and in red are periocytes. In response to injury, periocytes detach from the vessel and migrate towards the injury site. that's so important and I want to get over to the public and it drives me crazy when I see these presenters and they're talking about certainty all the time but the whole process of science is is about is built on probabilities which is a, a measure of certainty or uncertainty he who would valiant be against all disaster let him in constancy follow the master. And so we're used to that, and then we do this, and we do the experiments the best way we can, given that you can't afford everything in the world, and you, your, your students are not necessarily going to do everything perfectly. And then you write a paper about it, and then you get another lot of, of criticisms about what you've left out, how you've written it, what you should have done. explained it properly that's why they don't know it and so you, it gets better you know and you hate this process really you really hate it but it gets better joyful joyful we adore thee god of glory lord of love heard some fond life flowers by four uh, so first there's that process which goes on all the time uh, now because the code is coming out so fast what people are doing is putting it in as pre-prints and so this means that before it's peer reviewed it goes on the internet that means anybody can effectively peer, peer review it but it means that it's not perfect yet or even then it's never going to be perfect it's never going to be perfect so th th that's one thing that people don't understand about the scientific process that this is just normal and uh, that, that there's there's you know when you do some modeling you make some assumptions uh, you know, you make some assumptions on how many pe times people are going to meet, but then you can criticise those because there are hot spots where people meet a lot and then other people don't meet very much. The, it's all the elderly group who's vulnerable. Uh, if you kept them out of the equation, would, would the death rate go down? That sort of thing. If you locked up all the old people, um, you know, so many assumptions, many different possible assumptions that can, that can come out. And, and, and they are right to argue this is the proper process. This is not an aberration, this is not scientists um, 
uh, you know, doing, you know, these but scientists are bad. This is not that thing. This is, this is the normal kind of way to get to an answer. It's uncomfortable for us, but we have to get over it. Hide me, O the great Redeemer, pilgrim o'er this barren My beast, Marian, where he breathed, O David, he was dominion, Hello, my name is Hilary Rosen, M-A-R-C-A. Uh, I have two embroideries in a watercolour here. In these two embroideries, I have interpreted and visually reconstructed digital images from Professor Christine No Kelso's eminent work on leukaemia and bone marrow. When Christina sent me a selection of the images over a period of time, I chose these two but had ambiguous thoughts concerning the images. On the one hand, it is very harrowing to see the pathology of the leukaemia cells and the way they infiltrate areas in the bone marrow, and in contrast, I was quite seduced by the aesthetic of the image with the coloured dyes used, the form and texture of the image. The reason I chose to embroider the images both on paper and perspex is that embroidery is a new visual language for me and I can be very experimental with the surfaces and I hope the viewer will be intrigued by the surface and texture and also understand and see the permeation of the leukaemia cells. Bone marrow 1, 90 by 70 centimetres on paper. This is an embroidery on a monoprint. A monoprint is a single print usually transferred onto paper from a hard plate on which ink has been applied to produce a one-off print. When the print was dry, I embroidered parts of the print to produce the image you have, you can see here. I used varied coloured threads, i.e. wool cord embroidery silks and different stitches, plus netting to create tex texture. Here we see the red areas re representing the malignant cells, the yellow the healthy cells, and the cyan are the blood vessels. Bone marrow 2, 60 by 30 centimetres, work on perspex. I decided to use a perspex sheet for this embroidery, which I drew on top of with an oil pastel and then drilled holes in. The white stitching portrays the bone, the red area portrays the leukaemia cells, the green areas are the blood vessels and the blue is a dye injected into the vasculature. I hope to see, I hope to enable the viewer to see the pathology of the disease in a very different visual language and that's why I used the embroidery. The heart and hypertension here you can see a watercolour of the image plus a very large embroidery which I've just started. I am Cristina Lo Celso and I am Professor of Stem Cell Biology at Imperial College London. The images presented here help us understand how leukaemia grows in the bone marrow inside our bones and how it outcompetes healthy blood cell production, effectively shutting off and eliminating blood stem cells. In the image bone marrow 1, we are looking at leukemia cells in red and healthy blood precursor cells in yellow fighting for space within the bone marrow. 
In Scion is the complex vasculature that crisscrosses the bone marrow space. You can see that in some areas the red leukemia cells are most abundant, while in other ones the yellow LT cells are holding on to their ground. Blood stem cells generate all blood cells, and during our lifetime they produce more cells than there are stars in the whole of the universe. Unfortunately, sometimes this process goes wrong and leukemia develops. This is challenging to treat, in part because leukemia cells are so interspersed within healthy blood precursor cells all over the bone marrow. In the image bone marrow 2, we are looking at leukemia cells in red, blood flow in blue, and endothelial cells, which form the blood vessels walls, in green. Grey is bone surrounding the bone marrow. This study showed us that in red areas endothelial cells appeared abnormal and we have been studying how leukemia cells hijack them to make them more supportive of the cancer instead of blood stem cells. My research group uses an advanced microscopy technology called confocal and two-photon microscopy which allows us to observe leukemia cells interacting with other cells in the bone marrow space. We engineer these cells to express fluorescent proteins effectively shining in different colors when they are reached by light. With our work, we aim to develop more effective therapies for leukemia patients and also strategy that would make blood stem cells better able to withstand stresses such as leukemia, which we just looked at, and severe infections such as COVID-19, which we have not covered today. Scientists at Imperial College London are studying pulmonary arterial hypertension a disease where there is high blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries. This increase in pressure backs up into the heart, which then has to work harder to pump the same amount of blood and ultimately leads to heart failure. Of specific interest are the molecular mechanisms that control the behavior of cells in the walls of pulmonary arteries, with the aim of discovering therapies to reduce this blood pressure. Endothelial cells, which are exposed to blood flow, form a selective barrier with blood and are often referred to as having a cobblestone-like shape. Smooth muscle cells sit just beneath the endothelial cells and control the widening and constricting of the vessel. Alex Ainsco's PhD has been focused on creating a model of a pulmonary artery on a microchip that contains both endothelial and smooth muscle cells in order to recreate the features found in disease without the need to test on animals. The fantastic artwork created by Hilary Rosen shows a watercolour of the heart and lungs and also the cobblestone-like endothelial cells that have been stained with a fluorescent green outline which highlight the capacity of the endothelial cells to form a barrier.
Thank you.